That's great timing. All right, we'll cut that out. Ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Victor Frankel Meaning Academy. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel A. Franz, with my good friend, Dr. Baruch, Dr. Rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Baruch B. Halevi. Once again, coming to bring a little bit of mental health and meaning to your day to share our experiences in the field of logotherapy and to talk about today, we're going to talk a little bit about psychology, psychotherapy, and coaching, pros and cons, differences, history, etc. But before we do that, B, how you doing, brother? I am great. I am setting up here. Um, bottom line is just firing on all cylinders. We got the mini academy going. I got my man uprising going. I got you and I and our podcast going. Things are just going, man. I'll tell you, that's that is exactly the way I felt yesterday. We've introduced some new technology into our uh, podcast editing, and we're getting some shorts and some reels out there into the world with a lot of really good feedback. Um, I was hitting it on all cylinders yesterday, doing that again this morning. And B, I tell you what, I was running along at 70, 75 miles an hour, maximizing gas consumption, productive, meaningful, logo therapeutic all morning. And then I ran smack into the side of a brick wall. What kind of wall was that? Uh, yeah, so right, like literally, I'm still catching my breath from my last call. Um, so this this is, was a very meaningful call for me, but also a very emotional one. Uh, I may have talked at other points on the podcast. I know I've shared at different points recently. Uh, many people know my professional history. I started out in adolescent treatment um, through school and grad school. And then found a what was called an innovative and successful adolescent substance abuse treatment program in Indianapolis when uh, the lovely Mrs. Dr. Franz and I were getting married and moving. And this was an adolescent treatment center I really wanted to work at. I thought some of the innovations that they talked about were really quite fascinating. And it was a job of many jobs I had offers for. I literally begged for. I bothered that clinical director like for weeks. I'm like, you got to hire me. I am the best candidate you could have. Um, but much like adolescent treatment in those days, it was not always optimal. And there were some things that dated back to the 50s and 60s, really. And this group, if you want to do the research, check out this group, Synanon or Synanon, S Y N. A N O N, um, just just bad actors that started you know with some bad psychology in the fifties and sixties and propagated it well into the nineties. Abusive place, but some of the treatment that we did was taken from these old beliefs, and I know I worked to change that. But there are still some people that may have been harmed by it, and because of a recent Netflix show called The Program, it's a three part series. Um, that highlights some really bad treatment in the early 2000s, like just straight up abusive stuff. Um, some of the young people that I worked with back then are reaching out to me now as adults to talk about their experience and some of the whys of back then. Now, fortunately, every interaction I've had so far has been extremely positive and even commented about um, some of the care and good treatment that they received. But it certainly brings up some uh, some shadow work for me, maybe that I need to go through. Maybe some work, why I reflect negatively on some of that past. What are some of the um, conversations you're having? Like, what's the nature of those conversations? Uh, today's um, was really more about, hey, these are some of the things I've experienced as an adult, and I remember you being helpful as a, as an adolescent. Can we talk about this? Also, like this, this, uh, the program on Netflix is just bringing up some questions for some of the people we worked with. Um, I felt pleased, positive. I mean, the individual I spoke with just before coming on here had some very positives to say about my personal uh, impact on their lives. So I felt good about that, but also some, you know, some regrets from the way that the, our program, 
uh, maybe had treated that person in their family. Are, are you able to give any examples, not personal, but um, mm -hmm. so, so I, so we know what you're talking about, like what, what's the practices that aren't in alignment with your values or by yeah. today's standards? Well, I think the uh, adolescence, um, one of the things I even today still struggle with ad working with adolescents, right? Some adolescents truly are out of control. We worked with uh, substance abusing adolescents back then. And look, treatment resistant young people are hard to get into any kind of treatment. They're not going to go see a therapist for one hour a week or two hours a week. And so there were options back then that, you know, you kind of had to trick a young person to come into this place. And, uh, you know, and, and parents had to be less than honest with their young person. Yeah, we're going to go get a an assessment knowing full well that there's a good chance that, that young person could be in treatment uh, for an extended amount of time, six, 12, 18 months. The young person, or the young person, the gentleman I was speaking to was actually in that program for 15 months. Do I believe that's necessary to help young people to give up a year and a half of their youth for treatment? Well, some, some are that out of control, but uh, I don't know what other ideas are available. Um, I read an article a while back on um, Utah, and Utah has mm -hmm. the most amount of youth treatment centers in the country. I think there's various reasons, not the least of which is their, their laws are written so mm -hmm. that uh, a youth can be there, I think, until... 18 i don't know what it was but for, for whatever reason utah's the place i know this because i have firsthand experience we uh, ended up sending our son when he was 15 to a therapeutic boarding school in utah mm -hmm. um and it was both transformational and traumatic mm -hmm. right and there's lots of stories about both of those we had both so i've seen both sides of the equation it's mm -hmm. it's a complex and interesting beast yeah yeah well and, and this uh this documentary will tell you one of the reasons utah has some of the most there is that's where this um boy it was i can't remember worldwide association of specialty private schools or something like that started in utah had places all over the country and eventually had to be shut down because of their poor treatment but some of the leaders uh wound up in utah utah has a lot of them also because their laws are a little more lax i believe and you don't necessarily have to have professional uh staff licensed degreed staff it can be um there are wilderness camps there that are wilderness treatment centers there that just have people that are good out in the wild take kids out there and, and try to teach them how to survive and sometimes it's very very like you said transformational but for some it can be traumatic i hope i hope you had a good experience i hope you you and your family reap some positive benefits from it it was both but I, you know as, as we're talking this through and we didn't necessarily plan out the direction we never plan out the direction we plan out what the, have we ever we, we talk about the entry point let's say that the diving board we're going to jump into the uh logo pool mm -hmm. and it's interesting because victor frankel began his professional career in this very space. Uh, before the Holocaust, he was practicing psychiatrist in the space of, I don't know if it was teens, but it was certainly young people, teens and 20s, around clinical depression and specifically suicide. Yeah, he actually had, I can't remember the word that's used in, in the writing, but he had you know kind of boarding schools for young people, but also in a time where it was really, you know, Back then in uh, Vienna at post-World War One, it was hard to find a job. These people were suicidal. So he would find things for them to do. He would, you know, have kind of collective housing for them and then provide some good treatment. And the other thing I remember reading about his um, motivations is because, you know, the Viennese school system was extremely rigorous. Mm -hmm. And I kind of liken it to today's, you know, teenage rat race, very different, but sort of the same ethos where kids were burning out. They were succumbing to the pressures of, in that case, academics and the academic rigor. And, um, you know, I don't think that much has changed. I think the way kids get burnt out is different, but there is a burnout factor that is just part and parcel of our society. And, and, um, and we don't know how to or what to do with that demographic, as, as you know better than I do. 
You're exactly right. I run into that problem every few weeks, maybe few months of a uh, unruly or potentially out of control adolescent who wants to make their own decisions that may look adolescence is a time we are wired for self-destruction, right? We are wired to feel invincible that we can do anything. And without good parenting uh, constraints or a good parenting relationship, it's very hard for a young person to realize like, maybe I shouldn't do these things. So very often in my experience, it has a lot to do with uh, an absent parent becoming present and trying to exert discipline or just poor parenting practices that these young people feel they are maybe more in control of their lives than they are. Um, there's the other side that I used to work in, which was just substance abuse, which is also changing in 20 years ago. You know, back then, kids can be brought in and put in a therapeutic treatment center for smoking marijuana too much. Now, it's legal throughout two thirds of the country. Yeah. Um, you come from a clinical background, as our listeners know. I don't. I come from a pastoral background. Mine is much more of sort of a spiritual orientation. And so I see the problem primarily through a spiritual lens. I'm not saying it's exclusively that. There are times and situations where, you know, it's traditional therapy and clinical um response but i think we have a spiritual problem too and that means not necessarily going to church or synagogue it just means that we you know we've changed our context we've changed the the game but we haven't changed the player and in specifically with boys you know if you go to utah it's disproportionately boys um it's not 50 50. that's not what we saw when we were touring all these facilities it's like one girl's version to every five or 10 boys versions in Utah. And partially what, you know, what I see happened is the game has been changed and the player, the, especially the boys haven't. So everything about our academic situation, our scenario out there is counter to the ethos or the spirit of that 13, 15, 18 year old boy. He's not wired for what we have created. And I think that's a fundamental problem that we're not addressing. I fully agree. And I've said this often. I do not believe our current education system is set up for energetic young men, right? Maybe those that, you know, if we go back to the history of education, right, our, our education system is the way it is today because uh, Henry Ford, who had a lot of money back then, wanted more people who could be automated to follow rules and work on his lines. And he was a big investor in modern education back in the early 1900s. And not much has changed then, except now we offer uh, college to some kids who do, you know, who show that they can do well in high school, but our work environment with the internet and new technology is changing dramatically. Um, and, and I think kids are recognized that at a young age, they have more opportunity, but yet schools are still demanding that they learn in this old way and be prepared for this old workforce in raise your hand, answer the question, memorize the details rather than being taught to think and be creative. And so you're going to have more kids, you know, when they feel stifled, you're going to have more young people acting out and more questions of my goodness, what the heck do we do here? And if they're not acting out, maybe they're numbing themselves through substance use. Oh, this is an interesting statistic that I didn't realize until relatively recently. If you look at ADHD as one example, it is something like 10 to one ratio of boys to girls. It's yeah. overwhelmingly boys who have ADHD. And again, back to the wiring. And then you take that wiring and you don't change it, but you change the, again, the classroom and the whole educational structure like you're talking about. And a boy can't sit still. And a boy has taken, um, is trying to force his nature into a type of nurture, a, it becomes a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't mean he can't do it. It does mean he pays or we pay a price for making him do it. 
And I just don't see that many people talking about that issue. We talk about how do you calm him, numb him, force him, get him to become a square, to become a round peg in a round hole. Yeah. Um, going back to your point, whether it's in education or substance abuse, I, I you and I are probably going to be biased in this, but I believe when it comes to education and addiction, we have a crisis of meaning, right? People do not, are not discovering meaning in education, memorizing facts and statistics when they're all right at the palm. Why would you memorize something if you can get it at the palm of your hand? Why would you sit down when the option to uh, record yourself being silly or funny or athletic can make you millions of dollars, yet you're being trained to sit for eight hours at a time for a job that really doesn't exist anymore? Yeah, and you know, you posed it as sort of either education or treatment, you know, addiction. I, I do believe that the addiction and that all of that is on the other side of our educational system. If you try and force, because, you know, these kids aren't addicts traditionally at eight, mm -hmm. 10, you know, it's when they start hitting their teens, it starts to catch up with them and you see it really pronounced. But what would happen if we didn't have this force him to be a round peg when he's a square peg and we honored what he is. So for instance, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why wilderness um, programs are so popular in Utah and most of the boys that I met went from wilderness to the, the boarding school. Mm. It was a stepping stone because they needed to break them. They needed to get their that out of them and they didn't start with them in a classroom they end up in a classroom they started with them out in the wild right and speaking to that wild nature so i've just been um, doing a lot of studying for man uprising around myths and one of the myths i've been studying is peter pan it's this primal myth of the boy who doesn't want to grow up he doesn't want to be um, acculturated and forced into a chair to sit down and face forward. He wants to fly around with the Lost Boys and Neverland. And there's that piece of all Peter Pan and all people, but especially boys. And like, are we going to honor that? Mm -hmm. Are we going to speak to that? Or are we going to try and crush that as the starting point? Mm -hmm. Well, I know you're doing a lot of work for Man Uprising, but I'm doing a lot of work on two young ladies in my own home. So I'm going to take this the female route and, and agree that I think it also... Maybe it's not just the education system, but it's living in a post COVID world with kids that went through this shutdown in a different way than we did. Their entire lives were changed. Many of us still went to work. We just did it differently. And for many kids, they didn't work or they didn't have, you know, we talk about a world where we have very few rites of passages and it, one surely is graduation from high school. There was an entire year of students who didn't have that, who didn't have that rite of passage. And then we just shoved them off into the world of college to say, good luck, go figure it out. So the past few years have been disruptive to that age group. And I think we're we're reaping the, the, the sad side effects of it. And we need to figure out what I would go as far as systemic changes need to happen to make education more meaningful, to make life more meaningful. But you and I are not recording a podcast to change the system. We want to help people change their individual lives and families and communities. And maybe that changes the system. How do people go about changing this? Well, I mean, no, we're not going to change the system. But, um, you know, the people that I'm counseling and coaching are operating sometimes from the wrong paradigm especially with boys. I know it's true with girls too, but I really have two boys and two girls and I do see an empirical difference. And especially when I'm coaching somebody who's parenting a teen boy to, um, you know, to find ways to express the wild man, to express the Peter Pan, to honor it, to acknowledge it, to start from there that it's not wrong or bad. It needs to be harnessed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we're talking, I think what we're talking about are, are different ways to think about it, new ways to look at it. You know, when I'm working with somebody who has anxiety, as an example, I start with reframing it. Anxiety is not bad. It isn't good. It depends what you 
do with it? I think we even had a conversation about this. Do you harness it? Do you use it? Or are you used by it? I want anxiety. I want people to have anxiety. I don't want you not to have anxiety about your death. As Dr. Frankel taught, that tick-tock in the back of your head is what that anxiety is what gets you up in the morning to realize like the clock is running. What are you going to do with your one precious life? Absolutely. Now, I mean, last time we talked about this, you know, I fully agree with that methodology, but I was introduced to a new one this week through uh, my study in psychedelic assisted therapy and specifically what's called Oh, my internal family systems, right? IFS. And they talk about anxiety as a result of part of us that needs to be healed, right? So we've got two methods here. We can go through and accomplish, or we can go inward and try to understand where that anxiety comes from and, and refocus it. Apparently, what we talked about last week, refocus that energy in a more productive and healthy way. And I agree with both of those, but we have to be teaching that to our young people because they're some of the most anxious people out there. But I hear us saying the same thing, not something different, because what you're saying is that anxiety is serving a purpose and that purpose is calling out to you to tend to it, to address it, to look at it. You know, when my head hurts and I start listening to it and I realize I haven't drank water in 24 hours and I'm getting a headache, that headache, that pain, that energy is calling out to me to address it. So are we listening to the anxiety or you know, are we listening to the boy who's un, he's truant, he's he's unable to focus in class, he's you know masking his pain and suffering and addiction? Are we just addressing the surface or are we starting to speak to the root causes? Here's a real life example. My youngest of Eve turning 13 is dyslexic and for years was trying to force him into my way of re reading, of studying, of preparing for his bar mitzvah. Age 13, Jewish boys have a uh, rite of passage, bar mitzvah. And he's not his older brother who went more of a traditional route. He's his own guy. And so what we started to do, what I started to do was I stopped trying to fit, fit him into the square peg round hole and started to look at okay, he's this round peg. What is that going to lo look like out in the world? So as an example, I gave up on trying to force him down this rigid structured path. And for his bar mitzvah, we're going to be going to Israel and he's a dancer and he's going to dance at the Nova Music Festival site where all of those dancers were murdered on October 7th. And he's going to do his dance of tribute in memory of them. And that speaks to him right? That's his way. And so we're still doing the thing, but we're doing the thing by honoring his energy and his, you know, his, his nuos, his spirit. Hey, man, that just, that is lovely. Um, you know, every time we interact, my respect for you grows just a little bit more, even though you disrespect my cardigans, but oh, it works. Um, you, stop, you stop wearing them. But, um, it's getting a little warmer here. Um, but what a beautiful example of meaningful and effective and loving parenting. Too often, I come across parents struggling with a young person that say, well, this isn't how their older sibling reacted. And like, you're damn right. Right. Because as Dr. Frankel teaches us, as we all know, every human being is unique in their singularity and in their values and beliefs. And who they are, even two people from the same family, right? Like that are separated by age, but even two people in the same family who are not separated by age, twins can have stark differences. And we need to parent each child differently and, and meaningfully seeking that spark that you talk about, B, that spark of meaning that's within them and helping that grow. And here we go, disrespecting the education system again. They're not doing it that way. They're trying to fit all of the square pegs into one round hole and not focusing on the individual. Okay, so we can't change that, but we can change how people parent. You've got to pay individual attention to each child, to each member of your family. And, and to yourself, you know, like I found myself feeling like a failure. I mean, I was a rabbi in a former life and my son, I, I'm Israeli. My son doesn't really speak Hebrew because we had to leave Israel because the um, 
linguist, the speech therapist said, we have to choose a language. He's losing, he, he was becoming semi-lingual in two languages. Dyslexia mm. made it very hard for him when he was younger to learn both. So we chose to come back to America to learn English. He doesn't speak Hebrew. Uh, I was a former rabbi. He's not learning a traditional curriculum. And there's a piece of me I found in there that was ego tied up in this um, sunk costs into the system, my mm -hmm. system. And so what's wrong with me? What's wrong with him, right? Trying to fix him to align with my system. And I had to do a lot of soul searching on, <coughs> excuse me, on, um, you know, what's, what's true. What's, what's the truth here? Yeah. Boy, I love that phrase, the ego of sunk costs. And I think as as parents and maybe especially as dads, as men, we can get too focused on sunk costs and ego. Like, well, I've invested this much time into it, uh, you know, and, and so you better follow through with it. You better keep going and, and go do the thing that we prepared you to go do. When in the end, it's like, man, you have to you, you have to assess that. You have to do that soul searching as a parent. Is this really what's important? Is this what's true? Is this what's meaningful? Or do I need to help that child of mine express their nuos, find their spirit, and discover new, you know, adolescence is the time of greatest change throughout our human lives. And as parents, you know, sometimes as parents, we're like, why can't you just be more consistent? Well, because on a daily basis, I have more hormones and neurotransmitters bombarding my body and brain than I will ever have in my entire life. So maybe just work with me to help me find some meaning and see me for who I am today. And some of that comes from, you know, when, when I'm working with uh, parents, especially of teens, any age, actually, and there's that animosity and that vitriol and that thing that happens where they're just warring with each other. Mm. When you start to help people get under it, what's underneath that? It's not because you hate each other. You love each other, right? That's where it's coming. So, so what's going on, mom or dad, especially dads? And when you start digging deeper and deeper and deeper, it's fear. They're mm -hmm. scared. They're scared that if their child fails in school, they're going to end up, you know, on the, as a drunk, a homeless person. They're, they're, they're afraid. And when you can get down to that, that's when the good stuff starts to happen because you realize I'm just, afraid. And now I can back off of my attachment to my particular outcome of Aviv needs to have a bar mitzvah training to no, you know what Aviv needs to have walk his path and I need to support him and he'll be okay if he walks his path. But if he walks my path and I force him, he's may very well end up in a treatment center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, fearful parenting. Um, one of the, the saddest, scariest things I see is fearful guilty parenting guilt maybe because there was a divorce or because i wasn't a perfect parent five years ago whatever it might be and therefore i will cave to whatever the child demands there's a fine line to be walked there to help the child find their path but also to provide structure and discipline and guidance of the real world right the real world has consequences if we don't behave in particular ways right now we have freedom but as we teach here, we also have responsibility. And when we, we behave only along the lines of our freedom without responsibility, the world will have consequences. And that's what we need to teach their, our children, right? Follow your spirit, follow your nuos, but recognize the world have consequences if you don't follow it in a responsible way. And that's, I think, where Viktor Frankl was in his work because, you know, he, he made a name for himself around logotherapy for you know these teens for these 20 somethings and understood that it's not a context problem it's a content problem it's not the way it's being expressed in the world those are symptoms it's the root cause and the root cause is is logos is meaning right and and again we we talk a lot about this i can't find your meaning and i can't impart my meaning onto you but I can help you discover your meaning. It's true for adults. It's true for kids. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most important things we can do as parents is help our children find that spirit. Maybe even sometimes that defiant human spirit that we talk of sometimes. And maybe it's in defiance of us. Maybe it's in defiance of, 
you know, for many kids today, it's defiance of a school system that maybe doesn't agree with them. Um, and, and if they are, if they are finding that defiant spirit, how do we shape that in a meaningful, pro-social, healthy direction rather than in a destructive way? Um, I often say one of the greatest things we can do as parents is prevent our children from limiting themselves and their future, right? We can't always tell them exactly what their future is going to be. And it certainly shouldn't be exactly what we want them to be, but we can prevent them from limiting their opportunities as they grow. And one other thing I would add is that, and was it Carl Jung who said the greatest tragedy of a child is the unlived life of a parent or something like that. And you know, oftentimes we just got to look as parents in the mirror and say, is this my meaning and I'm trying to impart it upon my child or is this their meaning? And when you start doing this work of getting a getting in touch with your meaning, b living your meaning, things start to go easier and better on the kids. That was been my experience when I stopped sort of pushing my agenda. It doesn't mean I don't have parameters and rules and expectations, but it's doing this inner work of figuring out, you know, what's mine, truly mine, and what's something I'm just pushing on my kid. Yeah, that's such a powerful quote. I know every time I see it, it just, it, it reminds me uh, to behave myself and to make sure I'm taking care of meaning in my own life and rather trying to uh, force it upon the girls that, you know, the idea that an unlived life of a parent is one of the greatest strategies for a child. Uh, it is. We cannot live vicariously through our children. We cannot dictate every move they make. Our duty is to shape them, to help them grow, to help them find that spirit, to to nurture that spirit, that nuos of theirs, and find their path. I think we've said that many ways in today's podcast. Well, it's probably a good place to wrap up. We hit our running man mark of... Uh... Yeah. 30 minutes he's ready to well, turn around and go home look man i was i was ready for the debate of coaching versus psychotherapy psychotherapy versus coaching i feel like this is a tyson paul fight coming up here uh so maybe next time we're together like i i'd, I'd like to have that conversation with you because i look man i know you're not a classically trained psychotherapist you you're more therapeutic than you realize but i think we're both coaches and therapists in our own unique way We are, but I'm a big fan of of the emerging space of coaching, authentic coaching, not garbage coaching, of course. And um, we're going to have it out in the ring, you and I. Two men enter, one man leaves. Amen. I can't wait, man. But uh, we're going to have a sad audience because I know they prefer the two of us together podcasting. But after that, it's just going to be a single podcast. (laughs) Sometimes we just have to have the Thunderdome moments in our relationship, you know? Can't (laughs) wait. All right, brother. Have a good one. You too, man. Take care. And... To everybody listening, get out there and live your life with meaning, purpose, and resilience.